you want to start again? Okay, let's start again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I am Dan and this is Brian. Welcome again. As always, well dressed. Yes. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about democracy. And is democracy exportable? So America doesn't have many exports these days. Okay, but is democracy exportable? And yeah. will it take force, or are there some other? Oh, where would it be successful? Where can it take plant? Right, and the reason why we, we want to bring this up is because both I and Brian have been living on the Asian continent for quite some time. Uh, most of the time, we both lived in a one of the best and most interesting democracies on Earth. If and I may, that would be. T A W I A N. The, uh, yeah, Taiwan, of course. And interestingly about Taiwan, a great place. Yes. It's a place, it's not a country. Okay. I mean, it's not considered a country. Well, uh, let's not really go there. Yeah. So, okay. um, no, no, no politics. Whether, this, whether the democracy exists as a, uh, as an independent country or as a, as a autonomous or semi autonomous region, okay. either way, it's working, right? And right. Um, it's we. I think the 1980s were characterized as uh, <clears throat> Taiwan being an economic miracle, but mm -hmm. I think as we look at the, let's be blunt, the failure of America to successfully impose democracy elsewhere, uh, we could begin to see Taiwan and maybe you say Korea also mm -hmm. as yeah, uh, certainly Korea. Um, I democratic have, uh, miracle yeah a democratic miracle I have so. lived in Korea for six months and uh, in many many uh, ways is similar to Taiwan um, it's definitely more well I, I shouldn't talk about that now but yeah it's um, okay it's a functioning democracy yeah, it, so it, it you didn't feel oppressed there you didn't have to watch your language you uh, no no, not at all. I, I definitely felt like freedoms were similar to America. Yes, but you, yes. You I'm just I, any constraints were from not speaking the language as well as you no, don't know? no, no. I found plenty of people that I can communicate in English with, and I, 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 I did feel like it was a, a, a very male dominated society at that point. But this was uh, like almost twenty perhaps years ago. Perhaps it is, but uh, I don't think it's so much anymore. All right, well, let's not confuse uh, some cultural factors with yeah, democracy. Yeah, with, with democracies, yeah. They so are women have the vote, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I think there was a woman president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Just recently, yeah, there was a woman president. So that yeah. it, it, it has definitely changed a lot since 2001 when I was there. Okay, well, that was a while ago. Yeah. Um, Taiwan, Taiwan has been democratic, I guess, I believe the official answer mm -hmm. is since the lifting of martial law in 1988, mm -hmm. and some people would mark a milestone for the uh, opposition party winning its first election, which uh, I couldn't give you a date for right now, but it's right. a fully functional two-party right. democracy with essentially all the the rights and freedoms that uh, individuals have at home also mm -hmm. exist, at home being the United States, uh, also available to everyone here. Yeah, you know, I remember back in the 80s when I was still in the States, uh, I, I, would, I, I, I remember that I would buy all these different things and uh, I would read Made in Taiwan. And although a lot of people wanted to stay away from anything Made in Taiwan at the time, um, kind of like the, the things Made in China today, you know, people want to stay away from those. But, but then again, it, it, it got to a point to where a lot of things that were made in Taiwan uh, were quite practical and, and reasonably um, uh, affordable, uh, affordable or yeah, there's a market reasonably for them, priced. Right? I mean, yeah, you, they, you, it wasn't the Yugo, a car that everyone could afford but no one wanted. Yeah, yeah, definitely the, not. These and were that, things that were competitive for right. their quality at their price. And then of course, things made made in China today. A lot of people are okay with them you know oh, I'm okay they're with selling we yeah. wouldn't be talking about them yeah. if they weren't so yeah maybe at first things made in china everybody try to stay away from but i think now you know everybody's uh, you know thinking that uh, that's fine you know they're getting better and uh, they're affordable 
And uh, which, which, which brings me to the next point, which is I've lived in uh, places that are not uh, democratic society, societies, uh, like Vietnam. I've lived there for six months. We're all going to move a little bit here. Okay. Can I? Back in the days, uh, in 2002. That might be in the other camera's picture. Sorry, I'm interrupting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I missed it. You lived where in, in the days? Vietnam? Ah, okay. 2002. Wow, that's a long time ago for Vietnam. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I've I've enjoyed my time there, and uh, even at that time, it, it I could I could tell that it, you know Vietnam was com it had changing. the momentum. You yeah, could tell it, was it was changing. On the march. And even even a place like that, I wonder if it, it had to to you know export democracy because I mean a lot of the business and what's going on there, it's it's done based on democratic principles. Really? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, they have uh, the, a lot of the businesses are privatized, you know. And but we uh, wouldn't call China democratic at this point. Well, no, no, no. That's exactly what happened in China as well. China uh, changed a lot over the last twenty some years, and and that is the reason. I think also they they have imported a lot of democracy. Or I don't know. Let's not. Uh, I, I don't think we should uh, uh, yeah, mix get up. into a debate about whether China is democratic or not. Uh, uh, we will acknowledge the tremendous economic progress they've made and considerable social progress mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but maybe we'll leave to other people uh, the question right as to whether it's democratic or how much democracy it has imported on but it might raise an interesting answer to the question right. how much democracy do you need but, yeah uh, how much you enjoy I, I I'm like in Taiwan right now oh well, yeah I think uh, you know there aren't many people that won't like Taiwan at this point. Uh, there's a guy from Quillet. Uh, I think his name is uh, Jonathan K or something like that. He, a while back, he asked me if I was interested in writing um, um, something about Taiwan or the life in Taiwan or something like that. But yeah, so he was here. He was very happy. Uh, he enjoyed it, and uh, he said that he was, he was intrigued by uh, the what he saw here and you know especially the the the, the fast train that we don't have in the u.s at this sure. point and uh, quite a few other things but <laughs> let's try to go back to the roots of uh, democracy a little bit shouldn't we i don't know um i'm hitting the table uh let's see uh i want to take a minute and just say some of the things i appreciate appreciate yeah. about taiwan okay so uh these may not all be due to democracy, but I appreciate mm -hmm. that I can walk down the street and not need to look over my shoulder. Yeah. I appreciate that crime is low, mm -hmm. extraordinarily low, mm -hmm. at least as far as a foreigner can tell. Uh, right. To the extent of organized crime and so on, uh, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But um, and you know what's interesting? as it affects us, there's almost no crime. And, you and know a woman could walk across right. the city at night. And you here. know what's interesting? All the crimes or the more hideous crimes that ha ever happen in Taiwan are, ne are never really done against foreigners. They're usually done against... So far. Let's yeah. hope for the best. I mean, th there was like an incident with that foreigner that was found uh, buried in a... But he was actually uh, murdered or killed by another foreigner. He wasn't a Taiwanese. Dead. Several... Uh, I think there was a Taiwanese involved. I'm not sure. Yeah, he was. But uh, maybe he, he even studied in, abroad or something. Yeah, so they're all kind of Western. Like covering up stuff. Not... not doing the actual killing. Right. So. I think he was the lookout or something. Yeah. But uh, maybe we're wandering down the rabbit yeah, hole yeah, here. Yeah, we, we're, um, we're into here at this point. So very little crime here. And what else is there? Ah, the relationship between the people and the police is cordial. So you can watch yeah. you can watch the the local TV and see, um, see uh, an old woman pointing her finger in a policeman's face and yelling at him. And uh, that's just unimaginable in the United States, right. uh, <clears throat> how you have to deal with uh, the police in a more violent society. Uh, nothing against the police, mind you, but you know, people are not on edge around police here and have no reason to fear them. And the police are polite and helpful. 
Yes, that's what I was going to talk about. They're actually helpful here. Yeah, unusually. And yeah. Um, they're happy to see you too. You yeah. Um, yeah. I was pulled over one time because I turned right. You're not supposed to, by the way, you're not supposed to turn right at a red light in Taiwan. Even though, you know, they drive on the right and they have pretty much the same exact rules as in the States. You cannot turn right, whether you ride a scooter or whether you drive a car in Taiwan. And I got pulled over and um, I told the cop, which was the truth. It was like my first time in that part of town. And uh, I was uh, I was working at Donghai. I just got, mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. got my my job at Donghai at that, at that time, Donghai University, in case anyone is curious. And it was like the first day of uh, teaching. So I, I, I just got kind of lost, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, you know, in, instead of uh, the cop uh, asking me, do you know why I pulled you over? He asked me, are you lost or are you looking for something in particular? How nice. And uh, I was like, okay, if he's gonna tell me how to get there, then he can definitely give me a ticket. So I said, yeah, yeah, I'm looking for this university. And uh, uh, do you, you know, do you mind if you can help me out and let me know where it's at? And he's like, okay, I'm gonna go towards that way, but then you can follow me, and I'm gonna turn somewhere, and then you, I'll show you where to go. And then uh, I was waiting for him to give me the ticket, and uh, he's like, okay, just be careful. So, yeah, I think maybe in the U.S. the Police would it was probably, probably more like that a while ago in the States. But I, I think but they would also do the same for foreigners, right? If you're a foreigner and you do something I don't know. in the U.S., uh, no they're probably idea. not going to give you a ticket if they figure out that you you don't have a U.S. passport and you're there visiting. But the thing is, <laughs> there's so many illegal aliens now, yeah, they, they don't know how to, to, how to how deal to with that anymore. Like, yeah. okay, so are you a foreigner that's just right. arrived here yesterday and you're on vacation, traveling? We'd like or to be are, nice, are you an illegal that's been here for like months? And you know you're just, you know, disobeying the law. So, <coughs> okay. So um, I got a story about how nice Taiwanese people are. So maybe this will wind up being a uh, how nice the Taiwanese are video instead of any other topic. I don't know. But uh, yesterday I was supposed to take a local train from a local station to uh, to a stop local south. Scene. Yeah, <laughs> I I. Missed the first train. I got on the next train. It turned out I was on the coastal line instead of the the mountain, mountain line. line. Yeah. So I was going further and further away from my destination, and um, the uh, the conductors helped me reroute back. They helped me uh, on the train I was on, at the platform of the next station, and on the next train. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people on the train and it was no problem for them to help me which says something both about how orderly the public is here and how how helpful and friendly people right. are in general yeah do you think that's actually an advantage because taiwan is such a small place and you have so many people living in such a small area you think that no i think it's cultural humod homogeneousness homogeneity yeah. yeah they're culturally homogeneous I think that has something to do with it and something bad has happened in America I think Paul Romer did something about this which mm -hmm. I haven't read mind you but there's some breakdown in like network value or of mm -hmm. a neighborhood the okay. value of connections that's that that's the uh, yeah don't, don't don't kick the tripod we're doing enough hitting the table okay. Anyway, so I heard that there's an economist, Paul Romer, and he's got a theory of like the, some value of, of connections in, a neighbor, in neighborhoods. I think that's gone to sh shite in the United Scheiße. States. And um, like the classic American conservative push all functions of government as, as close to the individual as you can, I think that works better than national programs mm. and I think uh, I think if people had to interact at the local level if they regularly interacted at the local level I think there'd be more more stuff there I'm sure that um, uh, uh, Murray uh, in coming apart probably talks about this but I haven't actually read the book right but right. that seems I think yeah Charles Murray seems to have addressed some social issues. Uh, haven't read it. I wonder how he sees it. But um, 
you know one other thing that I want to bring up is the uh, Judeo-Christian values ah. I've, I've noticed that in Taiwan and Korea especially in Korea uh, Christianity um, uh, boomed over the last 10 20 years yeah. there's a lot of Christians in Korea and their numbers I mean uh, from the time the first missionaries went there to the current days uh, I mean the number of Christians has gone up so much uh, I think Taiwan is not I think it's a tiny percentage here actually yeah it's, it's probably a, even smaller in Japan yeah. which is another successful yeah, which Asian is, democracy yeah which is quite interesting because um, um, they're all very similar in uh, cultural values and whatnot. The Confucian, we could call them. Yeah. Uh, whether that's a fair way of putting it or not, mm -hmm. we would say Korea, uh, Taiwan, and Japan are all Confucian. Right. So um, I think we could formulate an idea here that uh, uh, where democracy flourishes and where it doesn't, if we're going to meander back to the original topic, mm -hmm. it seems that uh, the origin is Judeo-Christian culture and values right but it seems that there are some uh, some cultures that can get on board with democracy quickly and they seem to have uh, one thing that they seem to have or one group that seems to be able to do it is Confucian cultures mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right right they yeah. were able to implement democracy uh, quite successfully and uh, yeah rather, so rather they did it well, rapidly, yeah. you know. Rapidly, because you know, you look, you look at they Japan. They had no difference in the speed at which, very little difference at the speed at which they democratized and and they um, uh, joined the modern world, industrialized. Right. So you look at Japan; they had an emperor up until you know World War Two, when you know they sort of. Uh, I mean, they still kind of have like a imperial family, you know. They still sure have, they have a monarchy. But, yeah, but they yeah they have a monarchy monarchy but they don't actually have any anywhere close to the power that they once had sure um, so democracy probably has a lot to do with it you know especially well I think America democracy. let's let's also yeah. let's be honest uh, right. America was a major influence on democratizing these particular um, Confucian countries right um, America had an outsized influence on these three and it's much larger than these three and it had quite a presence uh, on all so three. So you think that type of democracy where, but, but where you we, see that we this bomb isn't the hell out of you and then no, we rebuild you? No, it seems doesn't work. It does, that, we, we've seen in the Middle East it doesn't work. <laughs> so this kind of reminds me of a um, the Buddhist cup is half, no it's not the cup is half empty thing. The Buddhist stereotype where the student asks a question and the, the teacher pours more and more tea into the same cup and the student objects, oh, the cup is full and can accept no more. And the teacher says something to the extent that just as your mind is full and you can accept you know, no more teaching, you must clear your mind of preconceived ideas. Exactly. It seems the Middle East has some very strong, well, maybe Islam I don't know and this is not an area of expertise we live in right. Asia yeah. but for <clears throat> comparative purposes it might be worth considering that perhaps Islam has um, some competing ideas that they feel are intrinsic to their religion or culture mm -hmm. that Absolutely. exclude well, democracy Islam, Islam means submission this is disturbing so, so that's a social <clears throat> relationship with God that so you have to submit democracy. so when you when you submit uh, there ain't, there ain't much room left for democracy, I take it. Yeah. But but th but then but then again, you have you have United Arab Emirates, and you know I've been there, and I I was quite impressed with what I've seen there. It's oh, it's very uh, uninhibited. You know, I mean, you don't have if you're a woman, you don't have to wear, uh, you know, the burqa or you know to cover yourself like you do in other Middle Eastern countries, and um, you know. Um, you can actually, you know, most uh, most Middle Eastern countries. You keep countries talking. I'm going to listen, but I'm also going to turn on some lights. I got these shadows okay. in my eyes. I think if we turn the next row of lights sure. on, sure. I'll look. Yeah, better. there, <clears throat> there's all these um, rules and uh, regulations. Like, if you want to get a hotel room with your wife, you have to have a marriage certificate, 
you have to uh, and stuff like that so so think for example like if I was to to go to to some of those Middle Eastern countries with my wife Selena uh, we don't have the same uh, last name on our passports and uh, what if we don't bring our marriage certificate then we won't be able to stay in, in the same room right but in in in, in uh, the UAE or United Arab Emirates you can they allow you you don't have to be married to someone to stay in the same Do they have room. different rules for locals and different rules for foreigners? I don't think so. I think they're 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 quite liberal in as far as like as as far as like how liberal can you be in a you know that particular type of culture. Okay. So um earlier um and you know what they are and, and and by the way they are the most developed of all the uh Middle Eastern which countries. Which is cause and which is affected. Yeah. Here. So if you look at that place, they have actually imported quite a lot of democratic principles, ideas, and uh, you know, values. Okay. So um, I was online, you'll be surprised to hear, mm -hmm. and um, a local and Facebook group. And, uh, and by the way, that's yeah. why I didn't accept the, uh, the really good offer I got from Saudi Arabia. It was there was just too many restrictions and too, too much going on that I just couldn't deal with. So yeah. Okay. So, um, but the Facebook group. when there was when there was this rare crime in Taiwan that mm -hmm. makes national news. By the way, there's so little news in Taiwan. Um, the news is boring. <laughs> Nothing happens. Yeah. So yeah. if there's one murder, it's it's news for ten days or something in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when that foreigner was killed by another foreigner. Right. Um, it was it was on and on and on forever. Well, I was on a Facebook group and someone with a, uh, from the Middle East, I forget which country, uh, said that um, Americans aren't taught, you know, this value, this value, this value. They're all basic things that a conservative American would, would espouse whether mm -hmm. they teach them or not. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I this guy immediately got a lot of pushback and I went to I went to you know Google and in two or three minutes I saw that the figures for every crime imaginable were minuscule in his country compared to the United States so I can't remember which one it was but it was a Middle Eastern country right it was conservative and uh, the point he was trying to make he sounded just like an American conservative he said that right. fundamentally you must value life and yeah I was thinking yeah. I'm hearing this from this source, but when I went and looked at the statistics, his country was very safe. Mm -hmm. Well, there are pretty safe places. Like uh, I had some uh, classmates from Jordan mm -hmm. that were, you know, in the studying the same PhD program with me uh, here in Taiwan, and Jordan's very safe and quite, you know, quite open-minded. Probably not as open-minded as, as uh, UAE. But uh, I mean, definitely much more open-minded than you know places like Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, you know. Yeah, I have my doubts about this whole Syrian adventure, and I even think Trump probably would not have been so aggressive had he not been portrayed as uh, pro-Russian. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this is is terrifying how domestic politics work their way yeah. into international affairs, but. Uh, Syria didn't look that different to Jordan to me as an outsider. I mean, uh, anyway, I hope that life returns to normal for these people soon. Right, right. And, um, well, I, I don't know if we should go uh, and discuss, go back and discuss the roots of uh, the Judeo-Christian values and maybe how it, how it actually started secular humanism. Uh, I, I, I can go back to one story that I read in the Bible a long, long time ago where Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well. I don't know if you remember that story or not. I remember that there's a story like that, but, but what she said. But, she said. yeah, that's not even important, what he said and what she said. What's important is that at that time in history, <laughs> nobody would sit down to talk to a woman, you know, because men, they just wouldn't do that. In, in most cultures. I mean, there were some cultures there that, you know, where men and women had more or less of a, 
dialogue. I think okay. the Greeks were, were, were more or less uh, accepting of that. But actually, even the Greeks, they, they used to think that women weren't as intelligent. And, you know, Jesus proved just that, that the woman can be just a, as intelligent as a man is and could carry on a com conversation with a man if she was given the opportunity. So I think that definitely that is a good starting point. I think I can, I can you can bank, uh, you know, democracy and, you know, secular humanism. Okay, well, I'm not sure democracy actually uh, is all that closely related to women secular getting the human? vote. I mean, well, women got the vote in the United, United States in the 1920s. So uh, civil rights, human rights, and these things, I think they do tend to improve under democracy. I think right. it's a hallmark Absolutely. of democracy. Well, you know, everything has a, a you know a but, certain type of evolution, yeah, and so forth. But I think you know if if they would have taken to heart that story and what Jesus did, democracy, I mean, full democracy or or a better democracy could could have come a lot sooner in the U.S. and anywhere else. But of course, you know, we all. People have prejudices, and uh, they have. Uh, it's not easy to accept. I like Ann Coulter on this. Well, yeah. That may be a, a trigger word for some people this yeah. morning. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Somebody asked her about uh, women getting the vote, and she said, uh, "We're not sure that's a good idea yet. You know, history <laughs> has to be play yeah. itself out." Yeah. Yeah. Uh, women have had the vote for about a hundred years, a little mm -hmm. less now. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, dangerous ground. <laughs> um, what well, what else we could uh, consider in terms of um, exporting democracy and uh, okay, well, the roots I, of democracy? Uh, if if we were to represent the cause of democracy as 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 something worth furthering rather than as an intermittent interest that people have uh, when it lines up with their other interests. If, if anyone supported democracy, like, uh, okay, I'll say this, and this is the alleged actions of an alleged character, but this may all be far from the facts now, but uh, if democracy was supported to the extent that globalism seems to be by someone attributed the name George Soros, um, if democracy had an actual you know, advocate with that kind of far-reaching um, vision and long-term game plan, if, if, if spreading democracy to individual countries was embraced by an effective uh, billionaire with the enthusiasm that globalism has been, then it would be logical to draw a list of what cultures are uh, most agreeable to democracy. Well, there's an idea right now of um, investing uh, charity in the places where it will do the most good, and the argument is you can help more people in Africa for per dollar than you can help in the United States. That's something I don't want to get into, the morality, the ethics, or reasonableness of that, but certainly if you were to bring democracy somewhere, I don't think Iraq would have been your first choice if that was actually what you wanted to spend a trillion dollars to do. It might be worth thinking which cultures don't yet have democracy and are most, most compatible with it. Certainly the cause of democracy would be served by expanding the area it occupies on the surface of the earth. And I think that that's a worthwhile endeavor. Right. So if, if some country like America really wanted to spend a trillion dollars on democracy, Iraq probably wouldn't be where you wanted to start. And if a billionaire wanted to undertake as a, as a gift to humanity something worthwhile instead of globalization and homogenization and God knows what, uh, why not perfect each country and let them interact with each other in the spirit of freedom and harmony that the founding fathers of the United States imagined instead of whatever the heck uh, is going on now where I have to agree with Brexit and against the globalizing tendencies that put put effective government further and further and less and less transparently away from the people it affects. So uh, part of the American version of democracy is local 
you know, control so that some of the things most important to you are controlled by fewer people closer you have more influence over or even can participate you can participate in it. But then let's look a little bit of, at the effects of democracy, okay? So you you know like like you brought up the the example with the billionaires. So you have all these billionaires that um, they invest into places where they can make more money or get additional uh, income. And then you have places like Africa that has rare mineral minerals which exploit child labor, right? Because of, um, you know, like uh, uh, you build a tunnel in a mine, it's easier to get a, uh, a child to because they're smaller and you don't have to make the hole too big to collapse and all that stuff. So there's, there's all these things. And then you wonder like, you know Taiwan and, and, and Japan and most of the developed countries in Asia they, they're very poor in, in, in those rare minerals so I wonder if democracy from the West would have come through the means of some rich billionaire investing into rare min minerals would I wasn't this, imagining it that way I mean look but would, would, have, would have have happened exactly the same in Asia would, uh, uh, in Africa would they have used child labor as well they have allowed it in Taiwan and, and all these other places based on the influence from okay from, well from uh, I think we project somewhat onto now I'm not advocating so children in horrible conditions oh, but yeah, yeah, in a farming community children already work so yeah, if you yeah. take a country that's yeah, but nobody living subsistent about agriculture yeah. African country with subsistent agriculture and you insist so children that children don't work, work right. they already work yeah so 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 is it is it okay for children to 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 work in some areas or some jobs versus others because uh, I think the morality of, of it is is in part calculated by the economics of it so no one seems to object to illiterate peasant farmers being helped by their children absolutely but giant corporations mining something maybe they should set their own rules but I'm just saying it would seem strange to locals perhaps to not allow children and it fact um, if people are going there voluntarily not at the point of a gun it may be that yeah. that's the best choice children have yeah. somewhere to be selling Nike shoes for some hours of the mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. or what have you I mean people are economic actors they're not they're not fools they have a choice between un unpleasant things we don't see their alternatives I, I sometimes I feel that Americans are sitting in America saying if that kid wasn't in the sweatshop he'd be shopping in the mall no actually he wouldn't be shopping in the with mall. what money he, he'd be scratching a stick in dirt and starving yeah. so I mean uh, you got to be careful how you help people right. out of their jobs right right absolutely so yeah I mean of course there's there's business ethics issues um, that uh, I honestly think we, we still have back back in the US I, it seems to me in the back of my mind there's this word governance and I'm not sure how corporate governance affects national governance it, there could be some some connection um, Hmm. Okay, so uh, I think in part the development of democracy in Taiwan is the only one I'm familiar with. Uh, there was outside encouragement, there was economic growth, there was the presence of Americans, and uh, there was also an organic interest. There was yeah. some, uh, a resistance to totalitarianism here called the, the White Terror, I guess, was the response to it. But there was an organic resistance, and I think that helped give rise to democracy. I don't know what the dissidents of the white terror exactly wanted. I don't know what their positions were. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there was some desire and perhaps an organized desire for something better and maybe that helped, helped uh, the ideas of democracy take place here. I think America also in the past has had a guiding hand in saying what they approve of and what they disapprove of and occasionally backing them up with mm -hmm. threats of sanctions right but um, again not not an area of expertise we, we just live here 
So yes. um, uh, we'll see. We just appreciate what Taiwan was able to offer both of us so far. Um, things might change. Uh, maybe soon we'll have to look for another place. To yeah. go and work, yeah, or, or, for or live in. Yeah, um, one of my friends says, "Opportunity is the ball, and you must yeah. follow the ball." Yeah, absolutely. So, it, the um, ball has been here for a while, but who knows where the ball yeah, goes next? Yeah. Well, I don't know. You know, I, um, I, I certainly hope that the U.S. can snap out of it. I mean, I would, I would like to go and live back in the states. At some ah, point. we haven't addressed what we think of America now. It, yeah. Okay. To be perfectly frank on that. The United States, well, Taiwan. Taiwan is about where I'd like the United States to be. It's oh, about yeah. oh, Bill of Rights, that again. but still freedoms you, you're giving up in America. Americans, are you there? Are you awake? Uh, freedom of the I press, freedom of expression. That's yeah. like the First Amendment, I think. Yeah. Somebody thought that was important. Why would you ask for it to be taken away? What mm. are you thinking? That's one thing I... I can't figure out <laughs> why the they decay are giving it up. from the inside. Is, uh, okay, so uh, we weren't here to criticize the United States. The United States has been the source of many good things, right? But right. we benefit more Definitely. from those ideas here in the current form than we feel that we'd be benefiting from. You them know in the something States. interesting that uh, that I uh, that I uh, that I came across while I was living in Asia or uh, while I was living outside of the U.S., I began to feel that the U.S. actually has the ability, or, or so it seems, to protect American citizens much better outside of the U.S. than, pr than protecting them inside the U.S. So, you know, this, this is what I'm talking about. If, I understand. If you end up in any country yeah. and you get into trouble, yeah. all you have to do is raise up your passport, man, and psh, believe me, you, you know. I think it was like that. I'm not sure it's still No, is. it's still like that. No, I don't think so. Uh, don't we think got so. a dead college student in North Korea. Oh, what? Well, and I don't, think, I don't think that it's but the I way mean, it was. I mean, in most, in most uh, other I don't think it's the extent that it was. Okay, so there was a time when you couldn't mess with a Roman citizen. And perhaps America had that kind of uh, political... Um, power abroad. So the consequences right. of mistreating an individual American were more than a country wanted. Uh, this seems to be on the wane. In fact, the value of individuals in America to America seems to be entirely on the wane. Um, in fact, the value ideologically of individuals in America seems to be on the wane. Right. There's a forced tribalism coming in America, where even people who don't want to be in a tribe are put into Coming their tribe from, from the outside. Near you. From, an out, from the outside, you're put in a box. Even if you say you're an American, someone's going to put you in a box. <coughs> anyway. Excuse me. So, uh, yeah. but And I, then I, you share the fate of the box, and no one cares about you as an individual. I, I think I still believe or think that if you have a U.S. passport at this point in time, it's still it's still a valuable. Yeah, it's valuable have. outside the United States. Yes, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, I don't know for how much longer it's gonna continue to be like this, or con continue to be this way. I I often hear that it's quite quite good or pretty good to have a Taiwanese passport because you could pretty much go anywhere in the world and. Uh, uh, you know, nobody would mess with you. You know. Uh, yeah, nobody puts a Canadian flag on their on their backpack because they're Taiwanese. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. In case you've never left America, there's a common practice of Americans putting Canadian flags on their on their backpacks and such, so that people will assume they're Canadian and treat them right. nicer than yeah, Americans. Yeah, and not American. Treated. So yeah, that's that's another problem <coughs> that uh, I'm beginning to consider more seriously. Uh, you know. There are some nice Americans that you meet abroad, but there's quite a few that uh, are pretty much closing doors for us very quickly, you know? And that's why a lot of those Americans are doing just that, because they feel that some of those Americans that live abroad or have been visiting different places abroad are pretty much closing doors for the nice Americans that live abroad. 
or the the better so um, <coughs> um I, I guess we could call uh, maybe maybe this is foul language uh, maybe we should avoid foul language um there's some common terms for the people who are making it worse um and most 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 Americans abroad are good um uh, good people um but the ones who aren't perhaps create a stereotype that that a high percentage relative to the local population of Americans may may be flawed in some terrible uh, some way that has negative consequences for locals okay. and I I I remember when I first came to Taiwan you know, some of the things that we bring from democracy are 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 good in some ways um, a lot of Taiwanese people I uh, I spoke to they said oh you know I like the American culture because oh, that's another topic that's an interesting topic yeah. culture I, is there such a thing as an American culture oh absolutely okay so anyway and, uh, the question is uh, when it looks like there's no American culture oh okay here's a basic proposition when America does something good and this is not original to me uh, of course but when America does something good it's a an accomplishment of all mankind and when America does something bad it's those damn Americans yeah so man on the moon all mankind um, any any conflict where America doesn't look good ah those Americans yeah. Americans in Iraq ah those Americans oh uh, well we had some provocation yeah. from that neighborhood <laughs> so um, it's not clear to me what America should have done so anyway what the point was that uh, some of the people that I met in Asia they were like intrigued by our American culture and Western values they're like oh you guys are so free and so on oh the stereotype of what people oh not stereotype the image of what people have for like uh, yeah you versus guys are so the reality open-minded you know and they're like oh I wish I could be more like that so um, yeah I, I suppose it's kind of hard to 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 grow up uh, in a culture where certain things are very traditional and very conservative and ah, this is actually one thing and wanting to be and wanting to be open-minded and you know accepting of different things but but then you you know you're forced to live with your okay, family so we both not we, accepting we, okay. and not not open-minded to the kind of things that you want to be open-minded to so then you have to you kind of have to live two different lives if you know what i mean okay you have to so be okay. this person to your family and then right. you can be this person to the foreigners okay so here's another basic question which is culture and biology so perhaps it's possible that um, uh, regions of the earth have cultures that are um, consistent with their biology you know and perhaps there is variation so Asians are classic okay so if we go to the stereotype for Asians they'll be they won't be given credit for their raw intelligence, which is mm -hmm. very, very impressive. What about their hard credit, work? Exactly, they're given credit for their diligence. Now, if we we both have a academic background for studying business, there's a business model, um, the Big Five mm -hmm. model, right? Right. So, uh, the trait conscientiousness, if that's high, then generally the trait uh, openness is not so high so yeah. America has a number of artistic people who you would not trust to feed your dog if you went on vacation and uh, a number of conscientious people who right. probably couldn't compose a hallmark greeting card right if anyone yeah. remembers yes. those yes. so there is a conflict between allegedly in individuals in any given population there's a mm -hmm. uh, some some will be highly conscientious but less creative and others will be more creative from the trade openness and they tend to that's be that's why it's probably a good thing to have mixed kids right between the two well I'm just saying that um, American openness and Asian conscientiousness those are both virtues and yeah. there's a downside to each right right so and I think the culture so actually uh, fits the people and the people fit the culture right so a little bit of genetic mix-up you know from all these interracial marriages that I don't know I, I kind of like thing. the world the way it is and yeah. I like I like countries and I like but the idea yeah, you could travel to a different place but, but it's but not Brian, just you want to go to the Starbucks in Egypt or the Starbucks in 
Japan. Right, but isn't your daughter isn't your daughter half Asian, half American? Yeah, so and I like kids. it, but but um, I, I'm not sure we want a uh, homogenous mixed world that the right. the globalists envision as the only peaceful outcome. Uh, I'm hoping there can be other peaceful outcomes. Mm -hmm. I like the world where it is, the way it is, where we enjoy actual diversity and variety. True. The people who say diversity, 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 they want to bring a cultural homogeny, homogeneity, and um, which which is a and, and they want us to be unable to speak of the differences between yeah. people, even yeah. cultural or physical, whatever which, that we which, may admire. Which brings me to the actual diversity. Which brings me to an important point that actually dates back all the way to Jesus, because Jesus, he, um, how should I word this? Jesus promoted the universal human. Which is yep, not the yep, diverse this is, one of the, this is one of the ideas yeah. of the West that created democracy, I agree. So, yeah. The Christian so, idea that all men could be saved. Right. So, so the idea here is uh, not so much this diversity and uh, stuff, but rather the, the universe, yes, universality. Christianity absolutely universality. was a force for universalizing. Yeah. Universal. So, uh, if you were Christian, you, you were in that superstructure no matter what tribe you are in yeah so hopefully we can we can um, see this aspect of democracy that uh, flourishes and con or continues to flourish uh, worldwide uh, of course in Asia this this uh, this aspect of uh, universal universal universality well the ironic thing is that okay the, the universal human universe <sighs> The West had Society? everything. The West had everything. You had everything. Yeah, yeah. They had universal rights and they had individual rights. Universality. There it is. The, they had everything. Why are they <laughs> messing with it? Um, I mean, do they know? I don't do know, they know how it's far okay. it's okay. Okay. it can go? It's okay. Do they know how? How? Do they know what it looks like when they go right. off the rails? If you've never left the United Look, States, you don't know what culture looks like off the rails. If they don't like it, they Most of the world is off the rails. And that, you guys that's go off fine. the rails, you don't know what you're looking at. And that's fine, Brian, because if they don't like it there, we can bring it here and enjoy it here. How is that? It's like watching your kids do something dangerous. You know, the kid doesn't understand electricity, and he's got a fork, and there's an electric outlet. Um, would you take it that far? Well, it sounds condescending, but yeah, the, okay. the, the, I don't know where current trends end or what, mm -hmm. what happens, but I don't think the people... I, people in America take wealthy, democratic, individualistic America as base, and then they think that they're going to elaborate and, and expand and do some improvements. They haven't seen the other side of the wall. They right. haven't seen what's on the other side if mm -hmm. they don't know what that was protecting them from mm -hmm. they don't know base human nature without without a high culture and uh, is that they're why they're trying to build a wall you know between mexico and the u.s <laughs> that's a metaphor when i said a wall <laughs> i know but on some hand you know on the one hand you do no you could look at the advanced world as as rome and you could look at what's outside as the barbarians and the yeah. barbarians are numerous and powerful but for them to become Romans, they will have to, if they want the benefits of being Romans, they will have to learn Yeah, they have to, to assimilate, the they have to integrate. They no, they have to learn it in their own countries. And they have to improve ah, their own countries before they point. can even, before good they point. can cross the wall. I want to see it already. But, 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 but I, I'm not willing you, to take millions and millions and millions learn of to, people who, did you who learn? might or might not work out. Okay, so Fix let me, it at home. Which, which brings, and then come visit. Which brings an important question. Did you learn? back home how to you know have the mindset and the you know the lifestyle and the to live the life that you are living now in Asia I doubt that you don't you know how American, you don't know how American you are it just 
Yeah. On the one hand, we swim in another culture. We don't know how Chinese we are either. You know, honestly, I don't think I was very American to begin with because since he doesn't know what it is, it's the fish doesn't know it's in water. Yeah, well, you know, remember I grew up in a very conservative Romanian family. Fish does not know it's in water. And of course, I grew up in the U.S. That's what the problem with Americans is. They they don't know that they are draining the water that that sustains them because they don't know they swim in water. Yeah, but you you get my point, right? So that's well, why how I was your was father much... different than you? I mean, my father? Because he was really from Romania. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I'm sure uh, he was he... An, a model immigrant. Uh, yeah, I mean, you how know, was his worldview different? Well, than he, you know, he kind of had the same experience that I that that I had coming to 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 Asia because he came to the U.S. when he was about almost forty. I came to to Asia when I was like uh, around thirty. You know, so not 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 much difference. So. Uh, of course, he, he, he liked a lot of the things. Well, well, first of all, he escaped from communism. So that was a big relief for him to begin with. Uh, and uh, of course, he rather embraced some of the good things about democracy, right? Not, not so much the bad ones. I mean, you know, it's not like, you know, like in, in, in communism, you didn't have prostitutes. So it's not like he came to the U.S. and, oh, I'm going to go and enjoy having prostitutes. You know, he never did that. He was a, you know, very... Uh, How did you guys become Seventh Day Adventists? Oh, were you already that in Romania? Yeah, he was a Seventh Day Adventist. Uh, he became a Seventh. He used to be a, a, a an Orthodox, a Christian Orthodox. Uh, before he married my mom, my mom she was born a Seventh Day Adventist. Uh, I'm I'm an agnostic, just you know, just for. Um, I'm an right. agnostic too. So uh, I, um, I, it's kind of strange because I don't think that. Uh, my father actually realized that on a on a on a sphere on a globe where you have different time zones, it doesn't really matter which day you worship because there's no there's seven, no universal seven, yeah, okay. Saturday or seven right, days. So but you know that, that, that's that, that's what people understood those days, and of course they didn't have the internet to educate themselves. So you know, but so you're not telling me that the uh, the only thing about the Seventh Day Adventists is that that. Uh, Services and are held. Oh no no no! I, I mean I, I I I can I can I can tell you a, a bunch of different things about SDA that I value, which is uh, you know the the health the health uh, aspect of it. Yeah, you know most of them are ve vegetarians. They 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 promote vegetarianism. Um, they and I think that one day of rest where you don't focus on the the the, the working things on your job. Well, you know, so they try. It's kind of a good thing because I think one day a week, 24 hours, where you give yourself a break. You don't think about work. You, you try you're to You're not allowed to work in most You're not allowed to work, yeah. In, in, I mean, back in the days when my father grew up, it was very, very strict. I mean, you know, people would ostracize you in church and they would, you know, they would, they, they would even like, uh, how, do you, how do you say, they would... They would they, they would censor you and they would really even, in they, church. They, they so would they, even ex they actually exclude you from the from the membership. Know. Yeah, sometimes so you would you get would a, be, uh, a, a, a censorship, yeah. and uh, you know, like it could go six months, it could go uh, a year, depending on how big the the offense See, was. See, that's an or, actual community, or it could be for life. That's they a community. Just, they just, yeah. So, so America used to be. America was there uh, at, it was a, at it was some a place point where many people had many community affiliations, but you know, overlapping. When when, when he came over to, to the U.S., uh, I remember I was as, as I was go growing up, I was like probably twelve, thirteen, when I when I was beginning to to uh, comprehend things, and um, he 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 was startled by by some things in America like homosexuality. He didn't take that very very well, uh, or you know like. Uh, other things like the trans movement and uh, what else? What, what else? What year did he? I'm sorry to ask, but what year did he die? Uh, 1991. So it's been a while. So he didn't see the trans movement, did he? Well, not not so much. But there was trans people living in in you know in Chicago at the time. We we grew up in Chicago. Chicago Chicago is a very diverse place, and uh, okay. right. yeah, there there was quite a lot going on in in, in Chicago, you know, and uh, even even Sacramento. You know, well, we moved afterwards, but he was yeah he had an issue with uh, with quite a few things he he couldn't he couldn't understand the fact that uh, you know although Jesus said love love everyone love your enemy he he just he had this thing for homosexuals I guess he couldn't 
he couldn't uh, bear the fact that there were going to be homosexuals in heaven and uh, a few other issues that uh, yeah I yeah. guess he, he, he wasn't his <coughs> cup of tea but I I, th I think well, let's, that, uh, let's assume God has this all worked out yeah well you know I yeah us, yeah. Agno as, us agnostics we can yeah. assume that yeah. God has the details worked out and uh, I, I don't know you know I, sometimes I had I had um, arguments with him on, on certain topics and uh, I kind of felt like he was not easy to teach an old dog new tricks you know but I kind of feel the same way now that I'm in Asia you yeah. know certain at times I have arguments with my wife about certain things that she thinks that I should uh, embrace or or you know take in and I'm, I'm kind of like my dad you know and I'm like well not about homosexuality but about some other things that I think that I should be more open-minded and I should you know embrace and then you know uh, well we're all on some uh, continuum and conscientiousness and openness seem to oppose right. each other and I know you're highly conscientious so don't expect to be entirely open-minded. Uh, right. If everyone was completely open-minded, no one would ever get anything done. They'd always be in the process yeah, of changing their mind. Yeah. Yeah, they absolutely. wouldn't agree on the end of a project before they, you know, they by the time they got to the middle of a the project, they'd have changed their ideas. Yeah. Right. Complete open-mindedness is um, not a virtue, and complete conscientiousness is also uh, a danger. Okay, so any take away or take okay um, so I'm going to synthesize the random thoughts I've expressed and I'm, I'm going to say that uh, Confucian culture is capable of democracy uh, it's currently in a form I prefer to the Stay. openness of the United <laughs> States yeah. um, and it may be due to the conscientious I was going to say it's in people. a form that we hope to stay <coughs> and we hope it stays this way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, you know, I mean, the open, openness of culture. I don't want to say open society because yeah. that's George Soros's globalism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the openness of a society gives right rise to many things. Uh, you know. Okay. Well, we're gonna have to stop on this one. We got a battery thing. So, openness, uh, conscientiousness, democracy. We've raised a few points, and maybe and, you can put them together. Uh, this one has got to save. So we're going to close while there's...